good morning everybody and uh, i would like to welcome uh, dr saumik dana uh, for the lecture today and uh, he'll be talking about uh, uh, using computation mechanics for design of uh, uh, carbon uh, capture technologies and other energy technologies uh, dr saumik is a postdoc at uh, university of southern california in los angeles usa and he has been working a lot on uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence and applying these in uh, in area of computation mechanics uh, prior to that he was also a postdoc at uh, lb at uh, Lor uh, los alamos national laboratory and he did his phd with at uh, ut austin where he addressed uh, uh, various issues related to modeling coupled problems poro mechanics and uh, i'm very excited about the talk today and i'm looking forward to it and uh, uh, the stage is yours, Samik. Thank you very much for okay. coming in so early in the morning. I think it's like 7.30 there. Uh, thank it's you. It's for you. It's 5.30, right? <laughs> and uh, Probably didn't get sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, let me hop on to the presentation uh, mode. Uh, can you, uh, can everyone see this? Uh... Yes, we can see. We can see. Okay. Uh, so the title, uh, thanks, Ajay. Thanks a lot for the uh, introduction. Um, so the title of my talk is Computational Mechanics for uh, Design of Energy Technologies. Uh, as I said, I'm working at the University of Southern California and I, I used a bit of calligraphy to kind of, uh, you know, put like a banner for the page as well at the bottom. Uh, so my background, uh, I, did a, uh, I did my PhD in engineering mechanics uh, at UT Austin, I mean, the major is not offered by every university over here. But it's it's kind of niche, but you know that's you know kind of a stretch of solid mechanics, and then there's also this fluid mechanics thing coming in. So uh, that's a major I got my PhD in, a master's and PhD actually. Um, uh, so I had to actually switch advisors in the, uh, during my time at uh, UT. That's the reason why I had to get two degrees. Uh, so uh, during that time, I worked on hydraulic fracturing and I worked on reservoir simulation. And I was working on, uh, for the hydraulic fracturing piece, I was working on a Fortran code. And uh, for the reservoir simulation, I was working on a mixed programming language code. So that was six years. Uh, for four months, I also did an internship at Siemens uh, Corporate Technology in Princeton, New Jersey, but that was a little uh, different. Uh, it was kind of offbeat, a little off the chart, so to speak. So I haven't put it over here. Uh, I did a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab for seven months. Um, uh, there were reasons why I moved out, but uh, at the time we published a paper and we uh, were working on a Python based code, which was do doing uncertainty quantification. And um, the, the uh, idea was to basically use reduced order models for discrete fraction networks. Uh, I did a postdoc at RPI and then again a postdoc at Baylor and now I'm on my fourth postdoc. So I've kind of moved around a bit, uh, but I'm be, I'll be sticking around over here for a while because I'm kind of enjoying the, what I'm doing right now. Uh, so my background, you know, in a sense is heavily into scientific computing, you know, fluid structure interaction, uh, you know, developing algorithms, uh, developing code you know, find, uh, trying to find out, you know, clever ways in which you can either speed up a code or, you know, maybe improve the algorithm, maybe look at the solver, maybe look at the physics, uh, look at the math. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of a lot of things which I've been working on. And I'll be talking about some of them over here, but mostly I'll be focusing on, you know, like a big picture. So I wanted to kind of focus this talk on like a big picture of how I look uh, computational mechanics is gonna be in the realm of energy technologies. Uh, so the first slide is a montage of, you know, you know, a lot of energy technology, so to speak, you know, uh, you know, up and coming as well. So you have wind energy, you have solar, uh, you have, you know, hydraulic fracturing, which has been going on for a while. I mean, it comes along with a lot of debate as well. And there's this new, uh, you know, term called geothermal energy, which I mean, in terms of, you know, the physics and the mechanics is very much similar to hydraulic fracturing, but there is a temperature term also it's, uh, that's involved over here. So that makes the uh, problem maybe a little different than fracturing, uh, but it's kind of the similar sort of a framework in from an algorithmic standpoint. Now, uh, if you look at the first couple of pictures, you have wind energy and you have solar. Uh, in both these cases, uh, you know, 
you know, the technologies are basically intermittent in a sense that when the sun is shining, the batteries are basically being uh, charged. And then when the sun is not shining, you need to actually draw energy out of the battery to power all the homes. So solar is intermittent because the sun is not shining all the time, right? It's like 12 hours, 12 hours. And that's kind of the case with wind as well. I mean, in some cases, in some places, maybe the wind is blowing day and night, but generally you have certain hours of the day when the wind is blowing more compared to some of the other hours. So to be able to make these energy technologies basically sustainable and actually power the homes, uh, you need good battery design. So battery design is the challenge for someone of my background who's wanting to make an impact in wind and solar. Of course, there are other people as well. I mean, people who have expertise in these two technologies per se, who work on the other aspects of it, but battery design is a very big uh, aspect of wind and solar. Uh, when it comes to fracturing, uh, you know, you have a lot of issues with go along with, you know, fracturing as an energy technology. Uh, initially, it was really nice because um, in the United States, I mean, it still is one of the prime, uh, you know, predominant, uh, you know, producers of, you know, oil and gas through this particular technology. Uh, but if you look at this particular picture, uh, what tends to happen is if you go deep underneath the surface of the earth and you drill a bunch of fractures basically through which you're drawing out the oil and gas. But what happens is uh, in this particular technology to stimulate the fractures, you pump in a lot of chemicals. Uh, not necessarily to stimulate the fractures, but to keep these fractures kind of open and active. Uh, but one of the big debates is, you know, uh, this uh, these chemicals actually kind of seep out of this sort of a very uh, dark green sort of layer, which is called the cap rock, and it goes into the water aquifer. And uh, the United States, I mean, most of the water that comes into homes is, you know, groundwater. So that's basically water that comes out of the aquifer. So these chemicals that you're injecting to, you know, draw out oil and gas are getting are seeping into the aquifers, then you're actually contaminating the groundwater reserves. And these groundwater reserves actually go into homes. And then many of the homes over here, you don't necessarily need filters. So people are used to kind of drinking directly off the taps, right? Uh, but these, uh, these chemicals are such that even if you do have good filters, you may not be able to filter out the chemicals. So you actually have people living in neighborhoods who are injecting a lot of chemicals through the water they're drinking. That's a huge issue. Uh, so that's as far as fracturing goes. So there are issues with regards to fracturing. Uh, there are challenges to make it sustainable and to keep going on with it. And this new uh, energy technology called geothermal is kind of the same as fracking, where you're actually, you know, going underneath the surface of the earth and you're creating a swarm of fractures. But there's a slight difference. Uh, in fact, uh, that difference is so subtle that I mean. It's hard to kind of uh, pick, uh, you know, just by looking visually, but, you know, the differences are actually quite a lot in terms of the mechanics and the physics. And I'll be getting into that uh, just a little bit. So this is just a montage of, you know, the, you know, the energy technologies and the kind of uh, challenges they pose. Uh, now, I'll keep talking about those. So uh, wind and solar intermittent at best. I mean, you need good battery technology. So there's a lot of uh, work uh, in in terms of multiphysics simulations. Uh, you know, in terms of modeling and simulation of batteries, which are being a lot of money is being pumped into that. A lot of papers are being written. A lot of papers are being cited. So you know, the, the, I mean, battery is kind of bottleneck uh, for these technologies to become scalable. Otherwise, it's just going to be one of those cool things which people say and then it just goes away. Uh, when it comes to enhanced geothermal systems, you know, this is where the subtlety is coming and how, how it is different to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, these are uh, some, uh, you know, words that, uh, you know, I picked up from recent uh, Department of Energy targeted call, uh, which we were looking at actually to write a proposal for. Uh, you have these, you know, low conductivity and high conductivity fractures, you know, underneath the surface of the earth. And by low conductivity fractures, you basically mean that somehow inside the fracture, which is a very thin sort of a streak, uh, you have a lower permeability. 
and a high conductivity fracture means that inside this streak you have a higher permeability uh, so in a, so typically in fracturing what we do is we basically want as many fractures to be high conductivity fractures so that you can you know draw out as much oil and gas as you can but in but in case of enhanced geothermal system what happens is if you have too many of those high permeable streaks to high permeability fractures then the temperature of the bounding matrix you know kind of is depleted faster right and uh, there's this term called accelerated thermal deple uh, depletion uh, which kind of limits the efficiency of the heat extraction so it's kind of like a heat engine so to speak where you need to kind of factor in some other things as well so it's not as straightforward as just you know having good drilling technology where you're just you know pumping in these chemicals to keep these fractures open and keep high permeability channels it's basically a balance between having enough high permeability fractures but not having so many that you are reducing the efficiency of heat extraction exponentially right off the bat uh, so that is a big problem and that's like you know the department of energy kind of next grand challenge so to speak and obviously you have oil and gas you know you have issues with regards to oil and gas there are environmental issues political issues basically uh, one of the issues with fracking is obviously the fact that you know the aquifer gets contaminated the other issue is that the more you drill and the more fractures you create uh, underneath the surface of the earth no matter what you're doing whether no, no matter if you're doing uh uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing or you're doing enhanced geothermal systems you're basically activating some faults underneath the surface of the earth which brings in the prospect of actually triggering earthquakes so that is again a very uh, important line of work that a lot of people are actually pumping in a lot of money and doing a lot of research on where you check the uh, the impact of what you're doing underneath the surface of the earth on seismic activity uh, so that that is also a huge issue uh, and there's a lot of money in fact uh, there is an, an, a consortium within the us which uh, basically is probably eight to nine universities where they actually pump in money and study do experiments and do simulations to study uh, what kind of you know waves like body waves and surface waves you are you know emanating from you know whatever tr trigger triggers that you're putting in you know underneath the surface of the earth whether whether it's a crack that's propagating or maybe it's a crack that's propagating and it's hitting a fault the fault gets reactivated the fault slips and then you have these waves that are emitted so there's a lot of wave propagation also which goes into these kinds of studies so that's seismic and then there's obviously carbon capture and storage so carbon capture and storage is not necessarily an energy technology per se but it kind of is uh, a complement to uh, you know you know the 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 oil and gas uh, that you're doing so uh, in essence a lot of the companies at least in the us that's what i know they are using this technology to get tax credits from the government to say that hey we're actually trying to do our best to reduce the carbon footprint so to speak uh, mm -hmm. you know of the atmosphere so they get these tax breaks and then they are allowed to kind of continue with the you know the oil and gas conventional and you know even the enhanced sort of uh, hydraulic fracturing sort of a thing but carbon capture and storage from the standpoint of physics is uh, very involved so you have multi-phase flow so you have multi-phase multi-component sort of flow and then there's also a prospect of a plasticity viscoelasticity plasticity over and above elasticity so that's poroelasticity poroelastoplasticity and poro visco elasticity and uh, because of the huge amount of co2 that is pumped in or is meant to be pumped in uh, there's a lot of fault activity that is triggered so there's a lot of seismic also that comes in so from the standpoint of mechanics and physics carbon capture and storage is the most interesting so to speak you get to test each and every piece of the code whether it's multi-phase flow whether it's poroelastoplasticity and how you know what it is that you're doing in terms of kind of kind of uh, modeling the waves as well so that is what uh, i've been working on for the past one or two months and uh, that's a paper i've been working on uh, so uh, let me before i get into that let me just again uh, 
give uh, you know some perspective big picture uh how does mechanics actually come into all of this uh in essence uh, you take uh, wind energy you take solar uh, so for wind and solar you need batteries right so you need to be able to design good batteries to be able to design good batteries you need to do modeling and simulation uh, the typical you know rigmarole of doing modeling and simulation basically being a part of a design team uh, now to be able to do that modeling and simulation you need to be able to understand the processes that are and that the, that are going on right so uh, what does the battery have to deal with i mean it has to deal with maybe some deformation it has to deal with some thermal runaway so you have okay identified the mechanisms that the battery has to deal with now what are the equations you pick up equations or maybe you in some cases you even derive these equations and then you say okay i have the equations now how do i actually do the modeling and simulation so you actually pick up a numerical technique like the finite element method or the finite volume method collocation whatever and then once you have decided on that you then say okay how do i actually solve it so you think of solvers and in the whole process you basically have to think of a flow chart of an algorithm because beyond a point even if you write a paper two months down the line you may not be able to understand yourself what you did unless you have a good flow chart uh, so the repeatability is important like you do a simulation and you maybe have to come back and do it again or maybe make some improvements so having a good flow chart or having a good algorithmic sort of a framework is very important uh, so you know as snapshot over here of you know the equations that go into these uh, you know these models and how they are coupled with each other and then there's one more over here of just pure fluid structure interaction which probably is used more in the aerospace realm but in essence you know when you're talking about mixture theory or you're talking about multi physics simulations you're basically coupling a bunch of phenomena together and both of these algorithms are staggered solution algorithms in a sense that you have a bunch of equations which are coupled to each other uh, but you somehow decouple them using some sort of a constraint and then you solve them sequentially and iteratively in a sense that you don't take the entire set of equations and you construct a matrix and try to invert it and solve it it can get a little complicated very intensive as well computationally intensive because a matrix has a bunch of terms left right center which you don't want to deal with so the staggered solution algorithms where you kind of decouple you know the the equations and then you get these nice little sub matrices which you invert and solve for and then you keep you know iterating are very popular uh so that is kind of what i am also working on i'm so the problem i'm working on is carbon capture ccus so it's carbon capture storage uh, now uh typically in these kinds of problems uh you know the activity the flow activity the flow and geomechanical activity is happening deep underneath the surface of the earth pretty much everything happens deep underneath the surface of the earth so you take a uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing you probably go say x meters underneath the surface of the earth for enhanced geothermal system you probably go to x even further so with <laughs> it seems like you're going deeper and deeper so uh you know you kind of have to take that domain or piece of rock which is kind of like very deep underneath the surface of the earth and you solve coupled flow and geomechanics inside so you have a porous sort of a structure inside which there's a lot of fluid activity happening and this concomitant deformation now what happens is uh you know fortunately or unfortunately in these kinds of problems the further you go underneath the surface the lesser chance you have of figuring out what's happening on the ground surface on 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 the free surface because imagine you have a domain which is say 100 meter thick like this particular reservoir over here uh, but it is at a depth of say 1000 uh, say it's 100 meters and it has at a depth of say 2000 meters right now if you take any grid a finite element or a finite volume grid which is discretizing the reservoir to whatever accuracy you want it and then you're extruding that mesh all the way to the free surface you're just talking about too many elements too many grid points basically and it becomes computationally infeasible right so this is where my contribution was doing my phd and even now is i was able to come up with this way in which you solve these two different problems on different grids so you choose a grid uh, which is much coarser 
uh, it's not an extruded grid it's a much coarser grid but it's an independent grid which goes all the way to the free surface and then you say that you have these two different like equation set of equations which are coupled but then you decouple them and solve them you know uh, sequentially and iteratively but on two different grids and the moment you are talking about two different grids and them you know being iterating you know these two grids need to talk to each other so i need to construct these operators through which one grid talks to the other and then you can kind of go back and forth uh, hi sir uh, i have a doubt here i'm sorry to interrupt you like how do you think this methodology has similarity or dissimilarity with overset methods uh with with what with methods uh the overset mesh method where we have two independent meshes and then they talk to each other and we can uh, change uh, actually the coarseness and fineness of that okay which which method uh, i uh, overset meshing the overset meshing strategy so basically we have two different meshes uh right. to control the fineness of the mesh around the region we are interested in then uh they gets interpolated the physical yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so that interpolation thing right that multi scale so correct me if i'm wrong uh, with the papers that i looked at uh, they are talking about nested grids so i uh, say you take a coarse mesh and a fine mesh so the co of the coarse mesh a coarse mesh is an exact superset of the fine mesh so to speak see where you take uh, one coarse element and you subdivide it into four fine elements and then you go back and forth so those are nested grids in a sense that there are no these intersections going on so so uh, uh, you no, take... i think that methodology is something like kind of adaptive me adaptive mesh refinement where like wherever the region you are interested in you refine it by doubling or uh, like multiplying the fineness uh but right. yeah anyway please continue we can discuss at the end i'm sorry for you yeah yeah that's fine so so uh what i know of is those things that uh, algebraic and geometric sort of multi and uh, this is a very important point so uh it happens at the solver level so i think even if there are no none of this two grid uh, multi grid business at the solver level it still tries to look at the solution and you know it, does its own like decomposition where it tries to look for coarse mesh like the coarser features of the solution it gets that the finer and goes back and forth that definitely happens at the solver level but here uh, the thing is that even before i get to the solver i'm actually kind of doing that but i'll be very interested to know if uh if there is something out there which uh is better than this <laughs> no uh, but anyways I, I don't know yeah i will read your paper and we can talk yeah yeah just uh, uh, absolutely so uh, in this particular case uh, what uh, the problem i mean we have picked up a field case uh, which is one of the actually the carbon sequest active carbon sequestration projects in the united states uh, you have a bunch of faults uh, which invariably you will find in such a huge area so these carbon sequestration projects they stretch over a lot of area because they're planning to pump in like 1 million 5 million tons of co2 uh so invariably you hit, you hit upon a bunch of faults which are like you know some are very small faults some are big faults basically but all of these faults are important enough for them to be considered uh because those faults can be triggered and then they can trigger a lot of seismic activity and you know earthquakes may not necessarily be triggered right at the moment but you know that activity which is triggered might actually lead to something which is maybe happening is going to happen two years down the line and the moment an earthquake sort of sort of gets triggered a lot of damage you know to the tune of millions of dollars happen so uh, these studies are going on for a lot of other uh, you know not just carbon sequestration but even for hydraulic fracturing and enhanced geothermal systems So in this particular case, if you look at this uh, picture, uh, Moro, this is where uh, you know the activity is happening. But you have these layers called Wellington, Chase Basin, and Tonkawa. So they have these terminologies. We uh, you know within the maybe the geological uh, uh, community where they look at these kinds of images and then they give them names and then they have certain features which uh, I think so. So basically, they they classified into certain categories. i think this is what it is i don't know much about that but 
the moro is where most of the activity is happening the top view gives us a bunch of faults over here the blue line is actually the extent of the field uh, so in this particular problem we were modeling faults one two three and six and one and two are called twin faults so you model one of them so effectively we're modeling only one three and six and the other reason is that we uh, right now we only have data for the wells basically for this piece of the field we don't have much data for this particular piece of the field uh, because uh, that is again a bit of a problem with the uh, you know with the reservoir simulation community is that most of the field data is you know kind of appropriate data which belongs to companies the industry basically and maybe they stop doing active research on them and they basically make them open source so that's one of the things that we are also kind of working on as well uh, but anyway so there is a staggered solution algorithm on top of which i have built this framework where we're top you know solving flow and geomechanics on two different grids and make these grids talk to each other to be able to actually be uh, you know model the geomechanics all the way to the free surface and uh, that will he that helps because you find for since you're modeling the piece of rock above the reservoir you can figure out what the free surface is the free surface deformation is instead of making heuristic guesses about it uh, all right so in this case uh, we, we take a mesh generation software make these uh, unstructured tetrahedral meshes. Uh, the flow mesh has 30,000 elements, geomechanics mesh has 40,000 elements. Those numbers are not really that important, but what's important is uh, the fact that the flow mesh is truncated at a certain depth. So the flow mesh is kind of stopped. I mean, you stop it over there, you, uh, no flow boundary conditions on all the boundaries of the flow mesh. But the geomechanics mesh goes all the way to the free surface. So you're having two different grids, uh, but you also have two separate domains so to speak i mean aerially speaking they cover the same region but you know in terms of the height the geomechanics mesh goes all the way to the free surface uh, instead of taking the flow mesh and extruding all the way to the free surface and treating it as a single grid problem uh, so that's the advantage and we have a choice of what kind of mesh we choose for the geomechanics you know say for instance we have certain lithologies or certain features that we want to capture Maybe say the reservoir is at a depth of uh, 2000 meters and we want to capture some say plasticity for whatever reason at a depth of 1000, then we can actually, you know, pad that layer, so to speak, or make that region a little refined so that you can capture that plasticity. So that's the beauty of allowing a framework where you use two different grids. And these grids, uh, of course, they need to talk to each other, but I, I do, once I make the flow mesh, I am not at the mercy of what the flow mesh looks like to make the geomechanics mesh. And the framework is such that I can make these two meshes talk to each other without too much uh, geometric dependency on each other. So that's uh, the advantage over here. Uh, now, when it comes to this, uh, as I said, like the data is there for one particular piece of the field. So there are 76 wells over here and the injection production is uh, 60 years. So that's what we do, uh, Jan 1956 to Jan July 2016. There are a bunch of producers and a bunch of injectors and you have these faults uh, and you have these wells very near the faults. I mean, there are, I don't know the specific reasons as to why most of these wells are near the faults. It could be that they drilled those wells and they started doing a lot of activity back in 1956. And then over a period of time, they realized that the faults are already existing, but prop at that time, they probably didn't have the technology to figure out there are faults in here. So this is one of those legacy fields where, you know, it was just primary production. You just drill a well and you try to drill out oil and gas, basically, right? It started in 1956, but over a period of time, what has happened is, and that has happened across the United States and many places across the world as well, but they're repurposing those, uh, those areas where they were doing primary production to do enhanced production and also now to do carbon sequestration. Uh, all right, so uh, these are some of the deformation plots. Uh, so the problem is being simulated over 24,000 days, roughly 60 years, but this is, these are the def uh, deformation plots at 10% um, of the timestamp. Uh, the, the, the important thing to note in here is 
if you look at the left hand side picture uh, you see mostly it's uh, yellow and then the patches of uh, red and the yellow basically means that it's 0 0.73 and 1.38 basically so uh, th these are positive values which mean and if you see that the z is pointing upwards which means that you see uplift so it's going up so to speak i mean the displacement of the top surface is so it's kind of bloating the the, the porous sort of spongy specimen is bloating but if you uh, look at this particular picture you have 45 producers and 31 injectors so producers are where you're drawing out the fluid injectors are wherein you're pumping in the fluid and typically as a heuristic guess you would say that 45 is more than 31 so the number of producers is more than the number of injectors so you're drawing out more and you're pumping in less so since you're drawing out more you expect to see subsidence you expect to see negative values over here but you actually see positive values because you know, it's possible that 45, in, in spite of being greater than 31, the effect of that 31 is more because maybe you're pumping at higher rates or maybe the well schedule is such that, you know, it just happens to be like that. So that's the reason why, you know, making guesses about these kinds of things can be a little awry. And that's the reason why it's important to model, you know, go all the way to the free surface. There's one more reason. Uh, Typically, in these uh, kinds of problems, what happens is if uh, someone is trying to figure out the reservoir uh, you know, properties like the porosity or the permeability, they do inverse analysis. Uh, so what they do is they get the ground deformation data from some sensors, basically, and they use that data as an output. And then they try to invert and get some estimates on the parameters for the model. So that's permeability, porosity and stuff. Now, to be able to do the inverse analysis, you need to do multiple forward simulations, right? And those multiple forward simulations you can only do if those uh, simulations it only make sense if those simulations have the free surface deformation as a part of the model. Uh, so that's one of the other reasons why you know you know having that sort of a framework is important. Uh, now, the uh, the reason why I put this, I mean, this is the uh, you know the the software that I'm working on, uh, and I'll, I'll get to why I have put this in here is, so there is a, of course, a certain framework, a certain sort of a flow chart, which we follow where we use a certain software to make grids. We use some pre-processing. We have the flow models. Uh, we have the flow model. We have the geomechanical model. We have some sort of a coupling. There is some pre-processing happening and there is some post processing happening so that's kind of you know the the it's like a vanilla sort of a framework that many of the simulators have uh, so you we have like an open source sort of a geodynamic simulator which can actually do a lot of wave propagation and earthquakes as well uh, it is basically a python code wrapping around a c++ code and then there is a flow simulator, which is a legacy simulator, which is written in C++. And uh, we couple the two. Uh, so you have a Python wrapping around C++ for the geodynamics. You have a C++ for the flow. We couple the two. Um, there is a bit of, of course, clever uh, code jugglery that needs to be done to make that happen. And we have these solvers. So for the for the geodynamics, we have PETC, which is a very common solver used for matrix vector operations. Uh, I think it was developed at Argonne National Lab. And then uh, to have that Python wrapping around C++, we have a bunch of Python packages, basically, which allow us to you know, do that sort of mixed programming language sort of a framework. Uh, the, you know, the, the thing is that I mean, this particular framework is a little tacky. I mean, it was similar to the framework that I've worked on during my PhD as well. There's a lot of uh, message passing interface. There's a lot of open MP. There's, you know, by the time you actually get to the results, you're so tired and drained out. And that's something which is a very common thing that's uh, observed in, uh, you know, with many of my colleagues as well is you get to the results and you're like, okay, I get the results and I'll just put it out, put it out in a paper and then get it over and done with. Because there's so much time and energy spent on getting these codes to work. Because you have mixed programming languages, you have a lot of legacy code, which is written probably in Fortran, which has been ported into C++. And a lot of the 
legacy code was developed in national labs, right, which was written in the 70s and the 80s. A lot of the plasticity codes that are used, even in the industry right now, were developed in you know places like Sandia and uh, maybe Lawrence Livermore. So there's a lot of legacy code that is written. And back in the day, people were not really that sophisticated. So it does make our job a little difficult. Uh, now, why is it that I put that is because that is where the next sort of step for multiphasic simulations is, right? So, uh, of course, working on these legacy codes is, uh, it's, 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 uh, to be honest with you, it's a pain in the bum. Uh, and there's a lot of time and energy which goes into kind of, uh, you know, kind of getting these codes to work. So people are saying, okay, let's just throw away C++ maybe. Let's just throw away Fortran and let's just use something called as a, uh, I mean, you have two different kinds of languages. You have compiled languages and you have interpreted languages. So Python is an interpreted language. C++ Fortran is uh, a compiled language. So with C++ and Fortran, you need to have a good, uh, you know, a good compiled language, so to speak. You need make, you need C make, you need to make these, make files basically very cleverly and then get them to, compile the C++ and Fortran code, get the executable, then run it on MPI. And then you have mixed open MP MPI. It can get a little complicated as Python is relatively straightforward because it's interpreted. So you don't necessarily need to put in a lot of effort into the compiler. And the other thing is it's a lot easier to write code in Python. It's, it's a lot more uh, as what you and I would write, a, you know, when we just Taking a piece of paper and writing out something, it's kind of like that. It's as close to that as it can get. And also a lot of these libraries are very well tuned with, uh, increasingly being tuned with uh, Python. The other reason is a lot of the, uh, the software and the semiconductor industry has hopped on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, deep learning. Uh, initially it was just maybe just a computer science sort of an artifact, but now increasingly, even companies like Google and Rescale and Onscale and all the cloud-based, uh, you know, uh, companies, NVIDIA has gotten into it. Uh, AMD is trying to get into it. Intel is trying to get into it. Uh, you know, so, so everyone in that particular realm is also hopping on board. So they're pumping in a lot of resource, a lot of manpower, a lot of their brains to actually do multiphysics simulations because they've identified that as the next big thing uh, so that is the reason why i believe that you know having worked on legacy codes myself and having worked on mpi and open mp and a lot of that other stuff which has given me a lot of trouble i see a lot of value in switching or me or transitioning to a more sort of python based deep learning based data driven uh, sort of a framework and which is what they are also uh, which is something that they're also getting on to and it makes sense. Uh, now, there are terms like digital twins. Uh, there are uh, uh, terms like uh, you know, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, which are loosely thrown around here and there. Uh, for someone who is more into the scientific side of things, you kind of can figure out what is what. Uh, but, you know, the fact remains that, you know, uh, and that's true now, even in India nowadays, that a lot of money is being thrown into AI and stuff. Uh, it's only time will tell how, how things pan out, but uh, you know, there's a lot of buzz going around, but I do believe that it's not just buzz. There's a lot of value as well, which it can add going forward when it comes to doing multiphysics simulations as well. Uh, I, now, uh, so uh, me, so me, I'm, actually I'm actually interrupting you. So what, since your problem is uh, involving so much, so many different physics and we have staggered coupling, as you said. So what's your comment on the scalability of Python in that sense? So that is, I think, one of the bottlenecks of Python. Right. Yeah, so I do understand that C++ is good that way. Um, I mean, even here in this particular framework, Python is just a wrapper, right? I mean, the low level code is still written in C++. Uh, but thing is, I mean, th that is something which I'll get to. Let me, uh, get to that, uh, sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, I kind of wanted to hop onto that topic, uh, that, uh, 
point as well. Now, what is, you know, with C++, I mean, with C++ and Fortran, yeah, I mean, they are scalable, uh, of course, but one of the big problems other than scalability uh, is with Python is, you know, you cannot code in, uh, at least up till now, a lot of the complicated sort of uh, math being converted into code. Uh, okay, so let me put it this way. When you have a numerical technique that you're using to discretize the system of equations, or right, either flow or mechanics or anything, thermal, whatever, and you're using some fancy finite element method, which like this continuous Galerkin or some, some stuff which, I mean, which is something even I have worked on, I have written a few papers on convergence analysis as well, but these techniques, there's a lot of abstract math which also comes in, there's a lot of, uh, it, there's a lot of rigor for sure, but you know, for someone to actually get a sense of what is, what that math is and to convert it into code, it requires a very trained sort of, you know, maybe a decade worth of training to actually get to a point where you actually understand that math, those numerics basically, and then convert it into code. And uh, that way, yes, I mean, for those folks, uh, C++ and I think to a certain extent even Fortran is a worthy, I mean, it's, it's useful. Uh, Python may be a bit of an underkill, so to speak, because it just doesn't feel like you can do any of that stuff on Python. But imagine that instead of using any fancy finite elements or any of that stuff, you just use finite, say you use finite difference or you just collocation, right? Um, and I know that there are a lot of issues with come uh, with not using a rigorous sort of numerical technique, uh, but since the focus is more on scalability, so maybe the code will crash a million times. The fact is that since there are so many people working on it, and maybe you can put undergrads or even master students to work on those kinds of codes. There's a lot of manpower and money being pumped into it. So it's basically like you throw a lot of resource and a lot of people on it. So you hope that focusing more on scalability uh, by hopping onto the GPGPU sort of a framework through a Python sort of a language frame uh, and focusing less on numerical techniques, it seems to me that's how things are proceeding. Uh, even in the industry, you know, I have worked on an MPI code in my PhD and now I'm working on an MPI code. But in the industry, typically they're not uh, big fans of MPI. They are more into Hadoop and Spark. Uh, they're more into cloud computing, you know, more into figuring out which class, uh, which instance we use for what kind of problem. Uh, so that is where the industry is moving. Uh, only time will tell uh, whether it's, and I honestly don't know how it works. Is is it like there's one person who's on top of NVIDIA who says, okay, this is what I believe in and everyone starts following on it. Or is there a team which decides let's move in that direction. But that is where most of the industry has definitely already moved. And that is where a lot of the folks in the national lab are also moving. And it's an active debate among a lot of these people as to whether you know, the switch from finite elements to collocation of, you know, finite differences, Python, GPGPO, a cloud, Hadoop, Spark, you know, these kinds of things, are they even going to solve the problem? Because at the end of the day, I mean, if you're not able to solve the problem to a certain level of accuracy, all these resources, you know, gone down the drain. So I honestly don't know the answer to that uh, question because I think that Python as a language itself has to go through a lot of improvements. Uh, multi-threading is, I mean, multi-threading is the least of what you would expect of a programming language, but that itself is, it's still under development, so to speak. So I believe that with sort of money and manpower they are throwing at it, they will come up with something. They will come up with a way in which you can offload a lot of the Python code on uh, GPUs instead of focusing on MPI or a cluster and focus more on leveraging the libraries that the cloud has like Amazon Web Services or whatever, and then uh, creating the executables through Python and then hopping, hopping them onto the cloud and running them. 
so i don't know i don't know how things are going to be maybe 10 5 to 10 years down the line things will uh, unravel uh, but that is where uh, you know a lot of the uh, you know the thrust is uh, I, I it it does make sense uh, definitely with the prob- kind of problems i have faced with uh, you know the legacy codes but i do believe that uh, that physics that was being captured by the code that i worked on during my phd and during my uh, current postdoc cannot be done in the current python state of the art sort of thing so i will stick to what i'm doing but i do see that there is a lot of value in trying to make that sort of a transition towards more of what the industry is trying to do as well right uh, that, that that is all i can say does that answer your question chandan Yes, yes. And I think from my experience, what I felt that as you have shown, like using Swig and all using Python to, you know, interact between two or more different solvers of different physics makes more sense in my opinion. And that makes the jobs easier. But yeah, so fully the if you like fully transform into Python, still there are computational issues, I think so. Yeah. So let uh, as far as the staggered solution algorithms go, I am convinced they are good. Like I'm convinced they are the way forward. I may not be convinced about, you know, this whole Python versus C++ debate. Uh, I am convinced about the GPGPU versus MPI debate. I'm convinced that GPGPUs are the way to go. MPI is painful. <laughs> true, true. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm also convinced that staggered solution algorithms are the way to go uh, because people also think there's obviously a part of the community which believes that why don't you want to do monolithic? You know, you're trying to get away with the fact that you cannot construct the system of equations. I said, no, that's not the case. Because if I make a matrix, which is like all over the place, you know, it's like a little little sparse here and little dense there, then the solvers are going to throw up, right? So I'm not trying to prove to someone that I can construct a Jacobian. Right, I am here to solve a problem. Uh, so staggered solution algorithms, especially given the fact that you know you have different softwares having different features. Like in this particular case on the right, Abacus is good for something, and then Fluent is good for something else. So if you really want to do fluid structure interaction where you leverage both those features, try to see what you can do in terms of you know marrying the two. Right, so. Uh, staggered solution algorithms yes i'm uh, uh, yes but there is one issue what i face mostly for fsi cases that like yeah it's uh, what kind of marriage it is so basically is it weak coupling or a strong coupling and what are your system parameters which is more accurate in one of these two and we have to choose it carefully so in for your problem what do you choose normally strong coupling or weak coupling uh so there is in the literature there is this sort of a coupling strength uh and uh, you know it's like five is considered that coupling strength of five is considered strong uh but again that coupling strength term is more for single phase flow coupled with linear mechanics when i'm talking about co2 and in this particular case co2 is a multi-phase multi-component three-phase three-component uh so that single phase sort of a thing doesn't apply and that too it's linear as single phase flow and but the proper the mechanics is still linear so that term uh in fact there's a paper that i've been working on and i got a review for that and actually commented on that so the reviewer actually asked you know can you put that coupling strength thing in so i just put up put those computations in but i also mentioned that you know i'm doing two phase flow with linear poro mechanics and this is more in the realm of single phase flow with poro mechanics so there is a coupling strength but it's not there i don't see any sort of fun- functional form for the coupling strength for three phase three component with say poro elastoplasticity uh, the thing is that as far as the variables go uh, you know the equations are such that the pressures and the saturations they talk to the mechanics like so you solve a uh, three phase three component and then you have pressures and then you have saturations uh, mostly the pressures basically because the saturations you know locally 
you know maybe in terms of say something that like viscous fingering it might be important but it doesn't have as big an influence on the deformation it's the pressure which you know kind of does everything and then from the geomechanics it's mostly the post process volumetric strain which goes back into the flow model into the mass conservation equation so that's where the coupling is uh now the more non linearities you try to bring into either of the two the more the stronger the coupling you would expect i mean you would expect that if you have plasticity in a certain part of the domain then those strains are uh, not only the strains but also the fact that you have these uh, you have energy dissipation which does actually play a role in how the flow is reacting to it because when you construct when you constructing the pdes the strong form basically they have to be thermodynamically consistent as well right so that is where i think when the more non linearity you try to bring into the model the more the coupling becomes stronger uh, true true yes so uh, let me like uh, so oh, sorry i'm just hopping back and forth so when it comes to uh, so okay so uh, let me go back to this particular slide now uh, most of this work at the you know under the hood so to speak is something in this realm uh you know this is like an engineering archive that i put out it's a half half made sort of a paper but uh so basically you take the strong form of the pde right so th these are the set of you take any set of like you take any model or you take any coupled system of equations you write them down you move all the terms to the left hand side you move you have the zero on the right hand side and then instead of the variable you identify what the primary variables are and so in this case other than you have the displacements the pressures and a bunch of other things as well and uh, what you do is instead of a p you have a p hat instead of a u you have a u hat uh so it basically is like a finite difference version of the pde itself so you have the strong form on the left and so to speak you have a weak form on the right i mean it's not technically a weak form because it's not finite elements but you have the so the discretized version of the pde where you just replace the primary variables by the hats now in case of deep learning what happens is these hatted terms like p hat u hat and all that they follow a certain framework of neural networks basically where you have weights and activation functions so you have stacked you have all kinds of neural networks basically i mean the simplest one being the feed forward but you have recurrent you have convolutional you have all kinds of you know mumbo jumbo but the thing is that you express these primary variables in terms of the activation functions the weights and maybe some of the other things as well and uh, you put it in this format and then what you do is you use that so to speak a residual and you construct a loss function and you basically trying to minimize the loss function so it's basically like a minimization problem where through neural networks you're trying to construct the loss function and then you're trying to figure out what kind of minimization technique i can use to minimize the you know the loss function now the community has been working on a certain set of activation functions uh which have become very popular uh, rectilinear uh, unit a sigmoid and hyperbolic time and a bunch of other uh, things are also coming out and then you have weight functions which the community has decided we are basically going to keep all the weight functions between 0 and 1 so you start off with a certain set of weight functions say if you have like 20 30 neurons you have 20 30 weight functions and maybe all the weight functions are one or maybe it's basically all a 0.5 or you basically have just a random distribution of weight functions that's your initial sort of a guess for the loss function and then once you have the initial guess in a sort of a newton sort of a way you're trying to minimize that particular loss function and with every iteration uh you keep improving upon the estimate for the weight function and the uh maybe even you know you keep switching back and forth between activation functions people are trying to do all kinds of clever things there's a lot of uh because of the fact that there is 
less rigor. I mean, because finite element method as a framework went through almost a couple of decades of hard theory. You know, a lot of abstract math and functional analysis was put in place to show that these finite element methods are very rigorous. So they have been put in place and they are actually used in design uh, for aerospace or whatever, basically. But, you know, unfortunately or unfortunate, I mean, again, things will unravel. There's less rigor when it comes to this deep learning sort of a thing. And they're just throwing a bunch of activation functions, a bunch of, you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, you know, Google and Facebook have their own. Like Google has TensorFlow, Facebook has PyTorch, and tomorrow something else comes up. So the day after that, something else comes up. There's a lot of chaos, uh, but there's, you know, hope as well. Uh, so in essence, this is a numerical, this is another numerical technique instead of finite elements using collocation. And in essence, you're basically minimizing a loss function. But, you know, the fact that, you know, you have TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are Google and Facebook, which you know that over with each and every passing day, week and month, they're only going to get, keep getting better at, you know, that framework. So there is hope that with all that money and resource that they're throwing into making these frameworks, improving these frameworks, these problems will solve by themselves. Uh, I'm kind of ambivalent on that particular thing. You can't just solve a problem by throwing a lot of resource at it. It takes time. Uh, and a certain set of consolidated scientists to kind of figure out, do the hard work. Uh, but that is where the state of the art is. And, uh, you know, I have an understanding because I uh, wrote a quick archive with a colleague of mine who's uh, right now at Cornell and, uh, you know, try to get a sense of how deep learning fits into the coupled flow and portal mechanics sort of a framework. Finally, I'll, uh, because all the pictures that I put up, they were obviously not from my papers. Some of them were, uh, some of them weren't. So I'll be remiss if I don't, uh, you know, credit uh, uh, them for, uh, you know, so most of them are actually, uh, you know, articles in magazines. Uh, and so, some of them are actually, uh, you know, papers as well. So it's a mix. Uh, the first one is a, uh, the first one is actually a consolidated effort by NVIDIA to get into the multiphysics space. So there are a lot of people actually working over there trying to come up with uh, deep learning based multiphysics uh, frameworks. Uh, Fujitsu, I assume the Japanese are also working on you know kind of the similar thing. Uh, the fluid structure interaction sort of uh, that that flowchart I got from. Uh, one of the papers written in the realm of aerospace. Uh, the the hydraulic fracturing piece I got from a magazine called Oil Man magazine, which is very popular among the uh, the fracture folks. I mean the oil folks basically. And uh, some of the stuff that I picked up uh, with regards to battery technology was from these two papers, these science direct papers. And uh, you know a couple of things I also picked up from the archive that I have with my colleague. Um, so yeah, thank you. With that, I end. I mean, that's uh, um, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Samik. Thanks, Thanks for the Thanks for wonderful the talk. Wonderful talk. Uh, I think we can open up for questions. I think there was uh, nice discussions even during the lecture. Uh, but I think uh, if there are any questions, I think we can open up for questions. You can unmute yourself and ask. So I will again trouble for me. So basically I am a bit of curious because I'm a novice in deep learning. I don't know anything. So I'm curious that in your this deep learning stimulated multiphysics framework, like how do you, what is the sequence of training you uh, do for this kind of neural network? So, and how do you couple that training data? I mean, that learning. So I'm just curious about it. Can you please elaborate on so, that? So uh, let me uh, get into um, it quickly. So, so this piece should be fairly, I mean, you have PDEs, you have the residual, and then you have a loss function that you're trying to minimize. Uh, 
so what happens is okay so now let me get into maybe some of the specifics over so if you see this loss function and you know i just in the paper i made it look a little complicated <laughs> just to get some brownie points but it shouldn't be now the thing is that uh you take the finite element method right so when you take the finite element method what do you do you take the pd you have the weak form and then you discretize then you solve it uh here what is happening is to be able to get the loss function itself uh you need to have a solution a priori like if, if you construct the loss function we need the solution say for instance you have grid points say you have a 20 by 20 grid so you have 400 points now basically the loss function is basic uh, the 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 addition of the loss function on each one of those 400 points right now at each one of those 400 points if your loss function also needs an exact solution or a solution from some other numerical technique then the point is lost right i mean then you're basically solving the problem using finite elements and then you're training your neural network using that solution i mean you might as well just use it you might as well just solve the problem using finite elements and get it over and done with right so that is where <laughs> a bit of the drawback is so what the next level for most of the folks working in this physics informed DL space is to take out that dependence. So now you don't need an a priori analytical or a finite element solution to get the loss function at each one of those 400 points, right? So you just take the problem the way it is with boundary conditions, material parameters, whatever. You don't use any other numerical technique you take the each of these 400 grid points, construct a loss function, add up those loss functions at 400 points, and then you try to minimize it, right? So that is where the next, you know, unraveling is going to happen. In this particular problem, I already had the analytical solution. So I did it for a benchmark problem called the Mandel problem, which is a, uh, you know, very standard sort of problem through which you try. It, it's like a test case for that code. So uh, there is an analytical solution. So at each one of those 400 grid points, I have an analytical solution. So I have, know the value of P, U, V, whatever, with space and time. And that solution that at that grid point goes into the construction of the loss function. Because I know the analytical solution. But I mean, if I didn't know the analytical solution, which is the case in 99.99% of the cases, then do I need a finite element solution at each one of those grid points to be able to construct a loss function and then use neural nets? Like that is, uh, you know, banana, right? Because in a sense that, why are you even doing that? You already have the finite element solution, right? So you solve the problem. So this is a bit of a problem. Uh, when it comes to training, what, uh, again, you know, it's it's very heuristic, you know, it's it's, like you take a certain number of training epochs. So basically what you do is, now what are these training epochs? So what happens is you have like, you know, these neurons basically connected to each other. You go from the input to the output, right? You look at the output, you compare it about with kind of what you're trying to get, or maybe you get to the output point, you look at the loss function, you're basically trying to minimize it by backtracing and then changing the weights and the maybe you know certain parameters in the activation function so you're kind of going back and forth right so one forward pass is considered an epoch so you go front then you change the weights and then again you go you go forward you have another loss function and then you change it's basically like newton with every increment that you take in a newton method you call it a Newton sort of iteration. This is exactly what a training epoch is. A training epoch in a physics informed DL is exactly the same as an increment in a Newton sense. That is exactly what it is. Now, what happens is you do that, right? Now, Newton, you know, in all his, uh, all his brains and a lot of people have worked on it. We have certain constructs where we use Newton and we know where to stop. When it comes to these kinds of training epochs, if you look at this particular picture, I'm, I'm basically plotting the log of that loss function. And I'm keep, I keep going down, but I don't know where to stop. So I just stop randomly at one particular training epoch. 
and then i have a certain uh, uh, set of cases called test cases so th this is like the training data set which i have used to construct the training epoch or maybe improve upon the neural net and then I have certain test cases and what i do is once i've constructed the neural network based on certain heuristic stopping criterion now i test how well the neural network does uh, with a certain set of inputs and compare it with what I expect to be the output. So, you know, it's basically like a play between how much data I'm using to train and how much data I'm using to test or validate yes. what I've trained. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very heuristic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, uh, Somic, so uh, did you try to use the uh, phys uh, pins physics informed neural networks? Um, so th that's where the physics informed comes in, right? I mean, the PDEs are the ones which are discretized, right? And then those are the ones which go into so uh, let me put it this way. So the difference between physics informed and non-physics informed is how you construct the loss function. Right. The moment the loss function has information about the PDEs, you call it physics informed. I see. Uh, typically when it was, when it just started off the whole, you know, this whole boom of using neural nets to do anything started off those loss functions were just like root mean squared errors right uh, so those were non-physics informed but here what is happening is you take the pdes you construct a residual just like you use in finite elements right what do we do we take the residual we integrate we multiply with a test function then you integrate it over a domain and then you do you know all kind of stuff right mm -hmm. So finite elements is physics based because the variational form comes from the PDE. Uh, it is basically exactly the same as collocation. The collocation method that we in any finite element course, the first few lectures are basically covering collocation methods, right? Mm -hmm. It is exactly the same as collocation. It's just that, you know, it's repackaged in a fancy TensorFlow Python. <laughs> um you know sort of pytorch sort of a framework so it is basically collocation uh so that's that's physics informed so i was wondering the kind of challenging problem you are dealing with right like where you told like even for the uh the false the informations are not completely there so regional basis it's proprietary by some companies and all so how do you plan to train this neural network like if there is not uh, so much of data already available in the physical point of view of that region experimental data or something like that so do you have to simulate all these cases to first generate what you expect and then you feed them to uh, test your neural network framework so uh, in my current work, we are not using any, um, uh, you know, uh, deep learning. Um, so this deep learning work was an aside um, to, you know, what I've been doing. I, the way, I mean, I don't see in the next even four or five years, anyone using this deep learning framework to do such complicated physics. I honestly think it's not doable uh, because there are way too many issues. A finite element is very well structured and it has a lot of benefits. Uh, so I don't see, you know, deep learning being used in the reservoir or, um, you know, oil and gas or, you know, so, so to speak, energy technologies. Uh, you know, whether you take battery design where you have, you know, electromechanics, you know, all kinds of stuff. You take uh, carbon capture, uh, multi-physics flow and geodynamics, whether you take seismicity or you take uh, just improvement of hydraulic fracturing technology. 
i don't see deep learning coming into any of that to be very honest with you i don't see deep learning right away coming into aerospace uh i they are using uh you know in the automotive space they're trying to do a lot of these uh things where you know it, it's more in the control systems realm where i think uh, deep learning has a lot of value uh because you know cars in a sense that you know you still have some scope in certain control mechanisms within the car or maybe even within the aeroplane where you can actually use these deep learning based models to do something but i think uh what what i think is all the effort that's being put in and i think people are just being a little trigger happy about what something is going to happen a year or two down the line this is an effort which will probably come to fruition in 20 years you might actually in 20 years see an aeroplane built purely based on deep learning right uh, an aeroplane design team basically just using deep learning instead of me may, maybe finite elements or maybe just using a lot of you know domain knowledge i don't see that happening anytime soon to be honest with you uh, but i do see that it's it's not in my opinion it's not a bubble that's going to burst it will continue because there's a lot of value in it uh, and i do like the fact that you know there's le- less compartmentalization now because everyone is getting involved right everyone has a stake in the game i personally like that because more people being involved means more interesting work being done more variety being invoked more money being pumped in more consolidation on the problems because i just felt that you know as a mechanical engineer you know companies like comsol or boeing or maybe ge or some of these are just you know just becoming very redundant and then you know google and facebook and nvidia they just doing their own thing so i want to see that sort of a marriage between you know all the computer science sort of brains that they have and the mechanical sciences sort of domain knowledge that people have so i do see that it's a bubble that's not going to burst but i don't see uh, you know it actually making an impact in the mechanical sciences 2 5 years down the line it probably be 20 years so hi uh, i have a small question uh, you mentioned the physics informed means uh, is basically having a knowledge of the partial differential equations now the complete physics is uh, described by not only the uh, field equations it is also the boundary conditions and that can be of two forms like dirichlet and neumann so when i am trying to train a network is it necessary that all the boundary conditions also need to be known or is it like because the reason i'm learning that sometimes it is very difficult to get the force boundary conditions you know Mm. and that is number 1 and number 2 is that the application of pin uh, mostly which is coming out now there is an explosion uh, it's mostly in the forward domain forward problem how good they are for uh, the inverse problem solution right uh, so let me go back to that slide again um so if you look at this um, uh, this uh l over here so there are these terms like lb so can you uh, can you see the screen yes uh, okay yeah so there is this term called lb that that's basically the loss function on the boundary and uh, so basically this nb is the number of points on the boundary and there is an l0 which is the number of points on the the initial condition so basically so you have time t is equal to 0 and say you have a 20 by 20 grid so you have 400 points maybe you choose 200 of those points so n not is equal to 200 and uh, the boundaries are obviously there at every time step so at t 0 delta t 2 delta t so you pick up a bunch of points on the boundary across time steps as well and that's where you construct the loss function so the boundary does come in so the pin framework what it does is that it takes obviously the 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 where the pd is active which is the open sort of set and then it takes the closure which is the uh, 
uh, the boundary conditions and the initial condition basically and it treats them separately so you have points in the interior of the domain both spatial and temporal interior and uh, you construct a loss function based on those points and then you have the temporal sort of boundary which is the initial condition on which the in so so the grid point values at time t is equal to zero you pick up some of them and construct a loss function based on that and then you have this spatial sort of boundary which is the boundary on both sides and uh, you pick up a bunch of points on the boundary maybe across time step and construct a third component of the loss function so the loss function is basically the interior the spatial and the temporal domain uh, now these say say for instance like at time t is equal to 0 a 400 grid points i mean which is there at all time steps how many points do you choose do you choose 200 do you choose 100 do you choose 300 it's just that again is a very heuristic sort of guess right i mean i can my n naught can be 400 all 400 of them or it can be 300 it can be 200 so the framework does allow for the boundary conditions also to be factored in but again it just doesn't give too much information about how many points because you know these kinds of studies they're very trigger happy in a sense that oh i got it working so i'll just put it out in a paper and then hope that someone else does it so someone has to pick up the tab so to speak but i haven't seen anyone do that yet um hopefully there'll be so more and more studies but this framework does allow for boundaries as well to be factored i see so now just simple problem there are problems like for example immediately it comes i, I work in biomechanics so there are a lot of problems where i need to solve the inverse problems where image based analysis needs to be done but let's say th th think about a simple problem with a cantilever with a prop cantilever okay so now in that prop can deliver at the tip of the can deliver if I have a spring and I don't have any clue about the spring stiffness, let's say. Uh, but I do have, uh, so if I need to now construct a loss function, uh, can I exclude that extreme end of the can deliver, the prop end? I do know the boundary condition at the fixed end. And I have the field equation. So is it good enough if and if I exclude that, then somehow I would be able to get the convergence? Uh, your specific question, uh, can't give a very specific answer, but as far as the inverse problems go, uh, you know, I, in that particular paper, I didn't work on it, but uh, from what I've gathered from having talked to a few of my colleagues over here, uh, in the US at, uh, at least is the deep learning framework is actually more promising from an inverse analysis standpoint than a multiphysics framework sort of a standpoint. I do not know why that is, Okay. but uh, you know, from what I've heard, definitely if inverse prop if deep learning or neural network as a framework is very promising for any inverse analysis then uh you know the problem of finding the spring stiffness should also be a very uh you know it should come in that particular realm and again inverse analysis is basically about you know estimating right i mean you don't the exact value you get a range so for the inverse analysis actually these neural networks are uh, very useful i think because inverse analysis just as the way it is structured it is an optimization problem it's a minimization or a maximization problem yes and these neural networks do exactly that uh, so i think yeah yes i think that you are right i think the parameters can also be a part of the you know, along with the weights, maybe the parameters can also be thrown into the optimization. Absolutely. Program. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, yes. In fact, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, the input, uh, not the input, yeah. I mean, maybe the, the, the weights, you have weights, you have activation functions, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe the parameters themselves are you know the loss function is a function of those parameters as well yes so it's basically a multi variable it's not just 
getting estimates on the weights. So it's like you start off with a certain set of weights and then you're trying to improve upon them. You start off with a certain guess for the parameter, say permeability, and then you're trying to improve upon that guess. Um, as to how the loss function factors in that material parameter, again, there is more physics informed. Uh, and I think that is where there is a lot of scope in terms of constructing the loss function, being very clever about it. Uh, but again, I mean, it's about being clever. Uh, you know, there is no very standard sort of a framework like the finite elements, or maybe even something like Bayesian, because, you know, Bayesian comes from a lot of theory, you know, the probability of this and the probability of that. So when you're using some Bayesian inversion techniques, you feel like you've done a good job because it comes through a lot of rigor. Uh, the deep learning again is heuristic, but again, it gives you an opportunity to be clever about it. Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, thanks hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Hari Krishna. Uh, very, very interesting discussion and talk. I just uh, have a few comments or observations. Maybe you can uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. One thing is that uh, whatever you have shown that uh, you're doing a neural network for a finite element method. If there is a, uh, the, as I understand, the neural network will be uh, unless you know the all the extremities say if there is a variable t in the kind of pro problem formulation for a particular problem formulation we have trained it maybe we can use for that kind of problems but if there is a variable t in the uh, problem formulation if some other terms come into picture the kind of uh, result because the network has not been trained there can be uh, it doesn't know in what way it has to be done. This is one uh, observation what I have. And uh, regarding the deep learning and other aspects, one uh, feeling that I have got is the deep learning, all these things, actually, if you see, majority of them have been in the computer science or electronics where modeling is done and where a lot of observation is already available for the, as you rightly said, for the inverse problems inverse problems means already a problem is already solved and means the problem is already solved and when we are trying to get back how these things have worked based on the already available results we are trying to say that okay this can be the other kind of uh, uh, outcome that can come that is how the inverse uh, deep learning uh, things will come so somewhere between these two things actually the finite element methods or these physics based formulations will have to actually uh, come and somewhere marry these deep learning mm -hmm. things. That is where the real uh, thing is going to come. And uh, uh, this is what I feel. So, yeah. Uh, so, in that kind of marriage, I mean, what I can, uh, that's a very good point. So, so in that kind of marriage, say, uh, Say for instance, like uh, in one of the slides, I showed the staggered solution, right? Where using finite elements, very rigorous, and then you are doing this forward simulation. But what if uh, my algorithm is not converging, right? Or maybe it has, it's taking 20, 30, 40 sort of iterations to converge in every time step. So people are coming up with acceleration techniques. Right, and uh, what they do is say, for instance, I solve flow and geomechanics, right, in one pass, and I have some information about the error, right. I use that information about the error to somehow kind of the next that in so, so with every iteration, the I keep getting information on the error, so that is my data for the AI driven or the DL driven sort of acceleration technique. So it's, I mean, honestly, it's called a posteriori error estimates, basically, wherein you're using those estimates to kind of improve upon the, maybe the performance of the same algorithm for the next time step. That is sure, but, you know, error estimates are very difficult to derive. They're very complicated. No one wants to read those papers. You know, my advisor has written papers no one wants to read. They just get passed and they get published. <laughs> so that is where I think these errors can be used as information or the data 
as you said to improve upon the convergence or the acceleration of the same algorithms so i think that is a good marriage uh, but as i said i mean just replacing that entire framework that entire staggered solution sort of finite element framework and hoping that dl will solve my problem is not going to be i don't see that happening in the next in the as i said like near future maybe the next 20 years it might happen who knows i mean uh, i mean right right actually for ai or deep learning you need to have much more data see that the data has to be fed in some way how do we generate that kind of data especially where there are very limited uh, experimentation results or something like that which we can say that yes this is validation so unless uh, the data that is fed in is uh, uh, enormous at least to the level of requirement the deep learning levels may not be able to make uh, uh, a full uh, capture of the physics physics data so that is where the physics have to uh get into and then by the experimentation or the results that is available as well as the physics based modeling and then multiplicity of the uh, variables all those things when we put together that is where the one then once again the ai driven or uh, data deep data learning things can come into picture this is what uh, as i see right i mean uh definitely i mean it's it's not like a one size fits all it's not the solution to all our problems but uh, there is one important thing over here is say for instance when you're trying say you have a phenomenon which someone is doing experiments on right and they are studying a phenomenon they are trying studying a physical phenomenon or chemical biology whatever but there are no equations like you don't know you can't even get to a point at which you do simulations because you don't know what equations are used to model now when we look at say even mechanics i mean we look at these you know this equilibrium element we take the square and then we do all kinds of shear stresses and all that and then we say newton's laws and all that it's basically based on the work thought experiments which people back in the 16th 17th 18th century did right so now if you have a new phenomenon and you don't really have a newton einstein around how do you get the mathematical equations to model that phenomenon right so there is a little bit of work being done where they are trying to use say you get some information you get some some experimental data and you say that is that experimental data enough for me to construct a pde so how do we do that we take a bunch of operators you have a curl you have a divergence you have a gradient you have a gradient of a curl or whatever it is basically you have a bunch of combinations that way so take a bunch of those combinations maybe take that as an input to the neural net right and then you have what whatever experimental data you have as an output and then you use this sort of a neural network sort of framework to make some combination of those operators to construct a pde for that experimental set up and maybe that pd might be a good you know mathematical representation of that phenomenon itself not just specific to that particular experiment it's very abstract i mean it's something which maybe an applied mathematician working on a pure mathematician might do but there is some scope in that realm as well uh, but yes i mean as an engineer uh, you know if you're trying to think that you know this dl thing with all the money that they are pumping into it is going to solve the multi physics problems that we face you know we are kidding ourselves right so <laughs> so that th- 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 that's that's what i'll say <laughs> right right actually it is actually the it is a fuzzy situation as of now it is it is it is very fuzzy yes Yeah, very nice talk uh, discussion as well. I really appreciate the many lectures. Thank you, thank you for all. Uh, any other questions or thoughts or ideas?
I mean, I had just one last comment. I think this was a discussion between you and Chandan uh, during the lecture about Python versus C++ and Fortran uh, compiled languages as well. Uh, other ones, right? But then, like, I think if, I mean, I wouldn't want to go into this, uh, let's say, debate or controversial topic, right? So, especially since the video is going to be recorded, I don't want to uh, <laughs> be on either side of the fence for now. Uh, but but then in general, I, I see that there are a lot of new development in Python as well, like for example, just in compiler and things like that, uh, which uh, people say speeds it up as much as C or C++. Uh, with JIT, mm -hmm. there's like a huge amount of speed up and uh, I think there are a couple of other things as well, like uh, which do lead to these kind of a speed ups. Uh, did you try, uh, did, do you have any experience with any of those uh, when you were uh, running these deep learning codes or? Uh... Yeah, I mean, so the, the carbon sequestration work is not deep learning. It's just uh, proper like. Or in general with uh, pure Python, did you try any of these things to see if they give no, us I haven't, I haven't, I'm not aware. I'm honestly okay. not aware of the, uh, I had a hard enough time with that. Actually, even TensorFlow, to be honest with you, I found, found it a little tacky. Okay. You know, the way it is written. Um, uh, but I haven't tried any of the new stuff in Python. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something which, and you know, uh, you know, it's over the past, uh, you know, 20 years, you and I, I mean, all of us have seen how programming languages are like changing like every every other year i mean it's just one one year at c the other year at c plus plus one year at julia programming languages come and go it's like you know so so i think that you know going somewhere down, going uh further down the road i see actually a marriage between c plus plus and python mm -hmm. uh, i do think that uh, these this whole framework of using a make file and then you know offloading it into a cluster and then doing that might go away because people are going to move into the cloud because amazon is going to keep making it cheaper and cheaper and cheaper so you don't necessarily need like this whole compiled language sort of a framework so i think in terms of language you're going towards interpreted but there are a lot of these uh, features within c++ at the back end which i think the folks who are developing Python code might want to draw out. And you might see a language like Cython or something like that, or Python++, you know. Uh, I haven't honestly tried any of the new stuff in Python, unless of course I absolutely need it because, you know, I, I would rather freelance into reading a novel than, you know, understanding a language because by the time say I go through a learning curve of a month understanding a language, you know, two months down the line, there is a new one. So <laughs> there is no point. Right, right, right. I completely agree. I, I just wanted to just point out the things like PyPy and the C Python, which uh, compile the code and they lead to like really good speed up. And especially if the code is written in an efficient manner, they they are said to be as fast as a C code or a C++ code, I think, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be like, I mean, at least I, I, I see that there's a lot of effort going into Python to improving it. I, th I was also reading an uh, article, I think, a couple of days ago where uh, they really want to push it up and really want to make it uh, more efficient. Uh, I mean, uh, so I, I think there's a lot of development coming in there, which is changing every day, like you said, I guess so. Yep. Yeah, I mean, only thing I can say is, is, you know, I didn't want to point it out, but there is a bit of a disconnect between academy and industry, right? So, in the US at least, where, you know, it's mostly C++, it's compiled language in academy and it's kind of interpreted language in the industry. So, it just feels it's a little too much in academia, it's a little bit of an overkill. And in industry, it's a bit of an underkill, you know, they just... Throw, they're wasting a lot of money and resource and we are very tight on the budget. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, that is a marriage which I do hope to see a lot more. Um, and you and I both know, I mean, that is not just the case in the US. It's 
pretty much in many places like there sort of disconnect and that that's the marriage which i like to which i'm hoping with this whole dlai sort of a thing that actually forces people to like we are engaging into this conversation and you and i i think uh, most of our audience as well are we love science and engineering we love algorithms we love mechanics uh you know we may not have done a lot of experiments but we want to you know if given if you're told to sit in lab and do experiments you might do that as well but it's forcing us to at least have a conversation about it and at the same time when the folks in the industry are throwing a lot of resources and not being able to solve problems they're also having to think about you know maybe drawing in some of the rigor that's there in academia so that's hopefully where this whole dlai and that's the reason i'm positive about it <laughs> um but again it's just hard to predict how things are going to pan out <laughs> right right uh any other questions if you did you there are no other questions then i think we can close the session and i would like to thank again saumik for the really nice talk and the discussion and engaging uh the audience and like answering a lot of really nice questions i think that would be quite useful for a lot of people and uh, i think this would also go on youtube this would be available there uh thank you very much saumik again for joining very early in the morning and uh, uh giving this really nice talk uh i hope everybody enjoyed it and uh, i look forward to meeting everybody again in the next lecture in, uh, in next, the next lecture would be again Uh, on uh, parallel computing and particularly with regard to cfd and high performance computing in cfd uh, by uh, dr aditya kunduri from uh, indian institute of science i hope that would be a really engaging lecture as well and i'm looking forward to it uh, thank you very much and uh, have a nice day everybody see you thank you everyone thank you sami see you bye bye thanks <laughs>